I am Joanna Shakti, the Soul Love Mentor, and I am truly honored to spend this time with you, to share with you my passion, my experience, my commitment to love in the world, to having amazing relationships, but more than having amazing relationships, it's having amazing lives that contain and feed and support and are supported by those amazing relationships. Because each and every one of us deserves to live a life of ecstasy, a life of passion. And maybe ecstasy sounds like one of those grandiose terms. Let's simplify it. A life of happiness, a life of joy, a life of pleasure, a life of love, a life of peace, a life of freedom. That's what ecstasy means. And soul love, which we'll talk about tonight, is the kind of love that brings us into ecstasy. It is the kind of love that unites us, body, heart, and spirit, in bed and out, whether we're connecting across the room, whether we're connecting across the planet because our beloved is traveling, or whether we are sharing a bed together. There are many ways to connect, and it is soul love that binds us. So you are in the right place right now. If you are hungry for that deep, intimate love and hot passion that I might call soul love and soul sex, you're in the right place if you're frustrated with love because you're not finding the right guy, it seems like all the good women are taken, or you're in that relationship and it's not giving you the experience of love, passion, intimacy that you desire. You're in the right place if you are an amazing woman who can't seem to find and attract a man who will meet her. You're in the right place if you're a man who ends up in the friend zone, or or who feels like you do everything to create a great relationship and it never works. Maybe you've been labeled the new age sensitive guy. Maybe as a woman, going back to the women, you've been named that strong, independent woman and you can't find a man that's strong enough for you. And you're in the right place if your soul, your being, longs for something that is deep, that is real, where you're tired of putting on the face and trying to figure it out and do it right and you want something that touches your soul, that is real, then you are in the right place if any of those apply to you. Because we're going to talk about deep, real, intimate love and how to create it attract it, build a relationship on it. So whether you're a single or you're in a relationship, whether you've been in that relationship for a week or many decades, anywhere in between, because the kind of love, the kind of attraction, the kind of sex that we're going to talk about tonight, it starts with you. And maybe some of you are already going, oh my God, she's going to bring it back to me. Well, I am. And I'll say that right up front. And you, your presence, your sexiness, your attractiveness, your happiness, your joy, your energy, all of that, all of you sets the stage for your relationship, the one you're attracting or the one you have. And if you're here, either you want it to get better or you've got a challenge and you want to improve that. So either way, we are going to talk about what destroys love in its early days of attractions, even the first mistakes or the the things that make a first date fail. We're gonna talk about what the barriers are 
to love and staying in love. We're going to talk about the top five mistakes that we make in dating and relating. And we're going to talk about the top five bonding factors that keep us connected in that soul to soul love. And so I invite you again to, as the week is coming to a close, to just relax and really just experience what we're up to. Try it on as if you might be in a, in a clothing store trying something on. These may not be words you've heard before. They may be words that you've heard many times before. I invite you to hear them fresh in this moment and to try it on like we might try that article of clothing. If it works for you, great. I hope it does. If it doesn't, I honor that. And I have so much that I want to share with you. This topic of soul love, this topic of soul sex, all the things that are happening in our world right now around the dynamics between men and women, around sexuality, around love, around the loneliness, around the struggle that exists in romantic relationships, but actually in the world right now. What we're going to talk about will support us, all of us, in the whole of loving and being loved in the world. And so with that, I want to take just a moment. Actually, I want to say one other thing. So I've started to say, I'm going to give you as much as I can possibly give you in about the next hour and a couple of minutes tonight. And... Uh, for those of you that want more, I will share with you places that you can check out to get more information and how you can even connect with me personally. So those will be things that I'll share with you later. And in the meantime, I want to offer you just as much as I can possibly give you right now. So I'm going to dive in. And as I'm diving in, I'd like to share just a little bit about myself and why I am so deeply passionate about this, why I feel this in my body, and why I'm called to share it with you. And the bottom line is, because really early on in life, I learned <laughs> what I thought was the truth about love, and I didn't think it was real. I didn't think it worked. I didn't think you could depend on it. I wasn't sure it existed. And the opposite sex, you know, which for me, I'm a straight heterosexual woman. I'm attracted to the opposite sex. And so my judgments and my fears of the opposite sex were formed very early. And I grew up in the heart of the women's movement, which also gave me a set of conditioning about how I was supposed to be as a woman. How I needed to hold up the women's movement. Like it was the heart of the 70s, very much the, the age of the coming out of women and taking charge and showing what was possible for us. And hallelujah, like that was so amazing. And some of us have lost part of ourselves in that journey. And it has impacted our relationships. And for me, I lost a lot. I got a, a degree in electrical engineering, got an MBA. I was working in the oil and gas and high tech industries of Houston, Texas it, with the good old boys in the 90s. And uh, it was intense. It was very intense about how, in the way that I had to show up to compete with those men, to manage men that were four decades older than me three decades older than me. And what I thought I had to do in order to be successful and be powerful and what I thought would attract a man. And then I attracted a man that was six foot three, blonde hair, blue eyed, was par golfer, concert pianist, valedictorian, you name it, he was it. And we were divorced four years later. And I wanted to blame it all on him. And then I dated and I dated and I dated and I didn't have orgasms, and I didn't have orgasms, and I didn't have orgasms. And then I wondered what was all wrong with all the men. I even said 
at one point to, to some of my friends. I'm like, why do I keep attracting all the sexually inhibited men? And then years later, I realized it was never them. It was me. And so this journey, I said a little bit ago, that this is so much about how you show up in relationship, how you bring yourself to love, to loving and being loved. Because this dynamic of love is something that comes from us and it is something that comes to us. And some of us are much better at letting it out than we are at letting it in. And some of us are better at letting it in and we're not so good at expressing it. So we want to come fully into this journey and this experience of love. And so I, there's a question that popped up in the panel and I just want to answer that real quickly. Yes, there will be a replay if you'd like to share this with someone else. And so this love that we're talking about is this flow, this dynamic that moves through the body, that moves through our heart and connects with another and connects with others. We're going to talk about aspects of self-love. We're going to talk about aspects of romantic and intimate love. We're going to talk about aspects of divine love, which I might call unconditional love. And how all of those can ignite the ecstasy of true love, the ecstasy that we can experience as humans. And so to complete my story, the reason I share this is because I didn't experience any of that. Self-hatred was my MO for 30 years. My ex-husband, the one we were divorced, the one I got divorced from four years later, he could never have loved me enough to have filled the hole in me because I didn't know what love was. And when I even got a glimpse of what I thought it was, I didn't think I deserved it. And so he couldn't have loved me enough. It was impossible. And I've apologized to him for that. And then on top of that, in the whole sexual journey, when I started to discover the clues to my orgasm, my happiness, my sexiness, my attractiveness to love, I made a commitment that I never wanted another woman to go through the pain that I went through. I never wanted another man to go through the pain that I put men through. I never wanted another human being to live without love. And it's easier than you think. And it's more profound than you could have ever, than I could have ever imagined. And I can remember the moments where I realized how deeply in love I was and that it actually didn't depend on a relationship, which we'll talk about. And so with that, this is why I do what I do, because I know the pain of not having that love. I know the pain of not having the intimacy. I know the pain of not having the orgasms and the ecstasy. And that's why 16 years ago, I made this commitment to serve. And I'm honored to be here on this journey with you. And so let's start out by talking about the barriers and the destroyers of love because they're going to set the stage for everything else that we want to talk about tonight. And the very first thing that I want to share is the idea that we misunderstand love. That's the first barrier. That's the first problem when it comes to having a relationship, when it comes to being happy when it comes to feeling loved is we don't understand love. And believe me, I, I, I didn't understand love. And when I say that, what I mean is that we keep imagining that if we just find the right guy or we find the right woman and they show up the right way and they don't push our buttons and they don't 
um, behave in the ways that we don't think they should behave. And they, they, they do life the way we think life should be done. And they make love the way we think we should make love. And they are that quote unquote perfect guy, that perfect girl that then we're going to have love and then we're going to be happy and then we're going to have a great life and we'll be happily ever after. And it has nothing to do with that love that we're talking about is not sourced, is not grounded in who we meet, who we're in relationship with. Yes, does that enhance it? Don't get me wrong. That that's not a part of what enhances the love, but it's not where it starts. And we imagine that it's out there and we got to get it. The truth is it's in here and we got to share it. When we talk about love and being in relationship, we have so many barriers in our own body, in our own consciousness to how we experience love. We've been hurt. I was hurt young. I went through, my parents went through a divorce when I was really young, young enough to be conscious of it. And I didn't think I was worth loving anymore. And then when people rejected me and teased me and I had all kinds of reasons to be teased as a kid, I was like, oh, I'm not worth loving. But if I do it the right way and I show up powerfully enough, then I'll be loved. And we all do this on some level. We put all these masks on and we try to be something that we think will either get or keep love for us. And oh, by the way, this is, we're talking about now the second barrier to love and being loved. So the first one, and we're going to talk about these a little bit simultaneously, but to go back, the first one is the misunderstanding of love and how it works. The second one is all of the ways that we abandon ourselves. So we put on this mask and we pretend to be something because we think that's what they're going to like. I had a client recently that said, you know, I don't do this anymore since I've been working with you, but I remember the times on a date where before I answered his question, what I would ask myself is what's the answer he wants to hear so he'll like me, so he'll want a second date with me. Had nothing to do with what the truth was for her. It had everything to do with what she thought he wanted to hear. And she is so not alone. We have, we, so many of us do this and we try to be what we think the other person wants us to be. And then we get into a relationship and we try to make the other person happy and we try to avoid the upsets so they won't be mad at us. Or we try to avoid the conflicts so that we will stay connected. And the very process, the very it's not a process. The very way that we try to keep that connection actually destroys the love. Because when I'm not being myself, trying to make you happy, who's in relationship? Who are you falling in love with? Because if I'm putting on that front, I'm not even there. You're falling in love with the front. The other thing that we do is all of these ways that we think we're not enough or we think that we're incomplete or we need someone else to complete us. And so we put on the masks or we put up the walls of protection. I don't, I've been heartbroken before. I am, I want to make sure I find a guy. I want to find a woman who will never do that again, whatever you experienced in the past. And so we put up these walls. And so then we've got you know, layer after layer after layer of how we should be, and I'm going to be this, and I'm not going to show you that, and I'm going to hide that because somebody judged that. And then we have another person that shows up over here, and they've got all their layers. And we think, well, I want you to love me for who I am, but I'm not going to show you who I am. So love me for who I am. See me for who I am, but I'm going to try to hide who I am. And that very act of hiding is self-abandonment. And there's, there's actually a therapist who wrote an article. 
she was working with couples for over 40 years. And I'd spoken about this, taught this for years before one of my clients actually brought me this article. And basically what this therapist said was that after her 40 years of looking at couples, the number one destroyer of intimate relationship was self-abandonment. Not honoring ourselves in the relationship. And so maybe you've heard this phrase before and maybe it's pissed you off like it pissed me off for many years. And that is we'll never love another until we love ourselves. And I can remember the first time in college, a man said that to me. He said, I'm not going to date you. You don't love yourself and you're never going to love me until you love you. And I was pissed and I was angry and I was hurt and I was going to show him. Uh, and about 15 years later, in about 15 years later, I'm like, damn it, he was right. So I said, my first husband couldn't have loved me enough for me to have felt that love because I didn't have a relationship here. So this is the second barrier. You've got to stand holy in who you are. And we're going to talk about how you do that here in a little bit. And when you do that, which is really ecstatic, honestly, when you do that, intimate romantic love with another will blow your mind. It will take you to places and realms that you didn't know existed. It's so deep and so powerful, so intimate, so healing and so awakening into the, the pleasure potential that we have. But in order to have that kind of soul to soul love, we have to bring our soul fully exposed to that connection. And I'll use a word that's really scary to a lot of people, including myself at times, and that's vulnerability. And it is vulnerable to love and be loved. And many of us try to push that vulnerability away. And then we wonder why we're not experiencing that deep, passionate love. And so I wanna come back to the third barrier. And the third barrier is that we really don't know how to relate. So first we misunderstand love. We imagine that we're gonna get it, it's gonna fill us up, it's like the movie that you complete me. It doesn't work that way. You're not gonna get the love by finding a partner. You're gonna experience the love by being it, and then when you find the partner, it's gonna ignite and enhance, it ignite, expand, and enhance the love that is already emanating in you, that makes you attractive to the one that is, and there's not just one in the world, but the ones that are a great fit for you. And so we turn it on here, and then we can share it here. But when we get into these relationships, part of what destroys them is the fact that we don't know actually know how to relate. Like nobody gave us a book of love. They didn't teach us in school how to relate, how to communicate, how to deal with upsets, how to express ourselves, how to stand in our truth. And they sure as heck didn't teach us how to make love, which is about the most vulnerable and exposed place we could ever experience. And so the truth is what happens in most relationships is we don't relate. We keep so much inside, we don't wanna say it. Because, oh my God, if they knew that about me, what would they think? If they knew I was that mad, they might leave. Or, oh my God, I don't want to be a bad guy. I don't want to show that I'm upset. That's petty. I shouldn't be upset about that. So we stuff it. Or the three different thoughts just went through my head at the same time. So I like pause because they're not going to all come out at once that it's as if when conflict arises, we're terrified that it's going to destroy the relationship. But in a soul-to-soul -soul relationship, 
It's actually what will bring us closer together. Let me say that again. Part of relating is dealing with the inevitable upsets that happen in our relationships. And we have to embrace conflict. We have to embrace our differences. And oh, by the way, if we're talking about heterosexual relationships and man and woman, we got a lot of differences. We think differently. We have different needs. We have different desires. We have different turn-ons. We have different ways we use words. And we've got to embrace those differences and inherently the conflicts that get created. But even if we're in a same-sex relationship, there I don't care how good both people are. We're never going to see eye to eye on everything. And we have to learn how to relate in a way that where conflict and challenge brings out more of the amazing, not the nasty, not the mean, but the amazing, brilliant being that each of us are. And when we do that, it actually, what, I, it, what happens is I call it turning conflict into communion where the upsets and the challenges bring out more of each of us individually, and then they bring us into deeper union with each other. And that's what's truly possible. What we're talking about here with soul love and soul-to-soul -soul relationships is that the relationship has a purpose. And it has actually probably multiple purposes. But in a soul-to-soul -soul relationship, one of the purposes is for each of the two souls to be more fully expressed in this universe on this planet. And through the love, through the seeing, through the witnessing, that we actually each become more of who we are, the relationship becomes stronger and the contribution of the relationship to the world is greater. And so there's a purpose in a soul-to-soul -soul relationship that is for each individual to be more than they were, not because they're completed, but because they come more alive. And then together, you make a difference in the world. And so that purpose, but we don't understand how to even begin to see that purpose individually and together. Because it's not something that society teaches us to talk about. Sole purpose of relationship? We don't hear it. But it's part of the loving soul to soul work that I do with people because it amplifies the power, the potential, and the ecstasy of every relationship. And so we need to learn to relate soul to soul, heart to heart body to body. And here's another thing that you may not know about relating, and it may scare you. So I'm going to be totally upfront with you about what it takes to have this kind of love that we're talking about here. And it's not a love that, actually, I want to say it this way. Loving soul to soul is not for the faint of heart, but it is for the deep of heart. It is for those of us that know there's something more to loving and making love. There's more to life than what we've been told. And if that's in your soul, if that's in your heart, then soul to soul love is absolutely your destiny. And it's a matter of creating the space for it. And so this learning to relate heart to heart, body to body, soul to soul is critical in having this kind of intimate relationship. And so I want to take a moment and, well, which do I want to do first? Actually, I'm going to show you something first. So this is a picture from one of my more advanced programs, but it's, it's a totally appropriate to just give you the concept right now. And so 
it basically says, and I'm not sure that on the camera it may reverse this, this, so you're reading it probably backwards, but divine humanness. And if we look at this infinite, infinity sign that it is around this heart, where it's this union of the divine and the human, the love that is our human love and unconditional love. And see, part of that misunderstanding around love is that we imagine that we as humans can do perfect love. That this person, if I find my soulmate, it's going to be all roses. I'm never going to get hurt. They're never going to get hurt. And we imagine that they should love me no matter what I do, no matter how I show up, no matter how I dress, no matter what I say, no matter what mistakes I make. And in a divine way, in an unconditional way, absolutely. And our journey as humans is to live into that unconditional love. And we will never get it all right. So when we expect that our relationships are going to be perfect, that they're never going to have upsets, that they are always going to be ultimately loving and nobody's ever going to say an unkind word, it's a setup for failure. It's a setup for disappointment. It's a setup for heartache. And so part of this journey of soul to soul love is to bring this full expression of the divine and the human, the human love that is fallible, the human love that makes mistakes, and the unconditional love that is absolutely in every one of us. We are divine. We are human. In the advanced work, I call it our divine humanness. And we, as I talked about that purpose, of soul to soul love part of the that purpose is actually bringing us more into our divine expression of love where we can experience the love that never ends that's always here and in that humanness there is an experience of vulnerability that I brought up earlier. And in the humanness, we have emotions. And this is part of one of those things that I said, you may not know about one of these secrets of relating, but our emotions are actually the language of intimacy. And that's kind of a problem for many of us, for many. It was for me for decades. Now I can speak emotion, no problem. But there was a time I'm like, emotion? What's that? I don't know what I feel. I have no idea. If somebody asked me how I felt, I'd say, I'm fine. I'm good. I had a good day. I feel good. Like, good, fine, okay. Those aren't emotions. Happy, sad. You know, if we want to just go with the basic ones, happy, sad, mad, glad. And then we can go into the deeper ones. Tender, excited, passionate, grieving ecstatic, blissful, pissed, furious, infuriated, all of those. And when we can express on that level, it's actually where the realness happens. See, we fall in love, not with someone's greatness, not with someone's perfection, we fall in love with someone's humanness. We can walk up and somebody can be telling us all the things that they accomplished and we may be impressed. But do we actually get drawn to that person? No, the moment that we get drawn to that person is the moment they get real, is the moment they get vulnerable. And so towards the very end tonight, we're going to talk about the, the top three things that have a first date fail and the mistakes that happen too often, the top five mistakes in dating and relating, but I'm gonna give you a preview. And that preview is that we're not real. And we hide who we are. 
So we fall in love with the humanness, the imperfection. And I'm not talking, I do a ton of work around masculine and feminine male female dynamics and the attraction that happens when masculine energy meets feminine energy and the sparks fly. And that's not really, if you want to see more about that, you can go check out some of my soul love mentor videos under the soul love mentor web series on the ecstatic intimacy.com site. But I do want to touch on it for just a moment because those two energies are massively attracted to each other, regardless of the orientation of our relationship. And for the feminine, she, I'll use she, although it's not gender oriented, the feminine is incredibly emotional. And what most women, because most women are feminine, not all. So not all, and not all men are masculine but there's a strong correlation between the two. There's commonly they go together. And what a lot of women and myself included don't realize is that our emotionality is actually really sexy to most men. I can't tell you now that I've embraced that. How many times when I've been really mad, I've had a man say, cause you're sexy. Or when I've been tearful and messy and they go, you're so beautiful. This is the power and possibility. So emotions are the language of intimacy. They are the language that connects us. And almost everyone, until they start to do work around this, has very, very small vocabulary of emotions. And hence, they have a very limited experience of intimacy. And so developing our capacity to feel, which, oh, by the way, if we want good sex, it's happening in our body and it's happening emotionally and it's happening energetically and it's happening sensually. And so beginning to discover what we feel emotionally and what we experience sensually, the vibrations, the energy, the subtle movement in our body is part of also what brings us into ecstasy of the body because the heart and the body and the soul are connecting. So if you want great sex, then developing a capacity for your emotions, developing a capacity to experience your sensuality. And yes, men, I am talking to you too. It's, it will, yes, when I go into this deeper, is it experienced somewhat differently in a male body versus a female body? It is. But the essence of being able to experience what's going on at a sensation level in your body and being able to feel it in your partner is what ignites hot soul sex. Hot soul sex, because we're feeling, we're experiencing ourselves and our partner and sharing that energy. So emotions are the language of intimacy and they become incredibly important. And so this is part of, again, the human experience where we are falling in love and expressing as humans. And that expression as humans brings us into the soul experience where that love is, oh my God, overwhelming. But what's also interesting is that the number of people, myself included, where love starts to open up and get so big or, oh my God, they're loving us so much. I don't know if I have the capacity for this. And we blow up the relationship or the potential relationship. Because one, we don't think we deserve it. Two, we don't think we can handle it. Or, oh my God, it's going to overwhelm me. And we push it away. So developing our capacity to experience the overwhelming depths of love is part of this journey so that we can receive all the love that's available to us. Because there's so much more than I'm, I can guarantee you you've tasted yet. There's so much more. But you have to open your body, your heart, your soul, your walls of protection in order to experience that love that you crave. You can't go find him or her that's gonna set you free and break down all those walls. You gotta take them down first so that they can come in, they can find you, they can see you, they can feel you, they can fall in love with you. 
And you have to know that even though you've got those imperfections, even though you're messy, even though you're not perfect, even though you're weak in certain areas, even though you've got things to be humble about, that you're still worthy of love. And that's our journey to know that in our perfection, in our imperfection, in our beauty, in our mess, in our wholeness, and in our non-experience of wholeness, in the shadow, in the light, we are still deeply worthy of love. And again, this is why the journey for us We have to stop thinking that we're not deserving. We have to stop thinking it's not there. All of the mindset that gets in the way of us experiencing this full potential of love and seeing it in another person. And oh, by by the way, another reason that we blow up dates and we blow up relationships is we expect ourselves to get it all right, but then we expect the partner to get it all right. Well, they ain't going to get it all right either. They never will. Nobody is ever going to be perfect enough not to push your buttons. And part of what destroys this relationship is that we imagine that they're going to be the knight in shining armor, the sexy goddess that is just all love and light and beauty. And and yes, it's all of that. And then there's the messiness. Then there's the imperfection. Then there's the jerk. It's all there. And we get to love anyway and be loved anyway. But the minute that we expect ourselves to do it all right or all right, or we expect them to do it all right, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. So for a moment, I want to invite you to close your eyes and breathe into your heart. Just take a deep breath in. We've been talking about love. We've been talking about the possibility of love, the infiniteness of love. So close your eyes and just connect with your own heart. Breathe into your heart. And as you breathe into your heart, allow the breath to begin to open what's been closed. And notice where it has been closed. Breathe into your heart and notice even as you invite it to open, how it wants to close. Breathe into your heart and notice where it's guarded. Notice where there's walls of protection. Maybe they're right at the layer, the outer layer of the heart. Maybe there's multiple walls around the heart. For some, it can feel like a hardened heart. Just notice what your heart feels like. And breathe into it as much love as you can give yourself right now. And if you're like me in the beginning, that wasn't very much, and that's okay. And if you can give a lot right now, then give a lot. Wherever you are, just offer the love that you can to your own heart. And then as you offer that love to your own heart, just imagine to the best of your ability, like a little kid, imagine what it would be like to experience love and connection and intimacy without any walls. Imagine that your heart and your love could get bigger and bigger if there weren't any walls. 
if it was open and soft. And then just imagine that love getting even bigger, like it could expand beyond your body. And then imagine it getting even bigger that it ex could expand to the size of the room. And then it could expand to the size of your home. Imagine if there were no barriers to love, that it could grow infinitely beyond your home, beyond your neighborhood, beyond your state, your country. What if there were no boundaries to love and it was infinite? What would it be like to rest in the vast, open, infinite love? What becomes possible? What becomes available? What could you give? What could you receive if you were that open? And just notice. And as you're imagining this wide openness and recognizing that you had your own barriers to love, if your heart had a message for you right now, just listen. If it had a request, if it had a desire, while you imagine and you acknowledge that this openness is available and yet there's been closed expression of the heart, there's been walls, what does your heart ask of you? What does it want? What does it long for? Just listen. And as you hear those words, just take them in, acknowledge them. And then take a deep breath and allow yourself to reconnect in this space. Just taking note of what you discovered about your heart, what you might have noticed about love itself and the possibility, and what your heart spoke to you. And as your heart spoke to you, as we recognize that there are these walls, I wanna to speak to what I call the path of soul love. We've been talking about it, but what does this path really look like? And how do you personally walk this path for you so that you can have the intimacy, the ecstasy? the soul to soul love, the living and loving and ecstatic union that we've been talking about. And so you have maybe, and if you don't, it's in your emails, but this recipe, if you will, for soul love. And I want to talk about the three columns that if you looked at that, it was the gift that you got when you registered for this, that it actually highlights this path of soul love and the experience of deepening and deepening in this journey of ecstasy. And so I want you to know how this works so that you can choose the path that you want to take and you can know how to have this infinite ecstatic intimacy, this soul love everywhere, in bed and out in all your relationships. And so the first phase that's on your, your recipe is what I call, it's what we want to experience in the first phase is ecstatic authenticity. And the way, this isn't actually on your recipe, but the way that you experience 
ecstatic authenticity is by activating the soul love within you. It's bringing your soul, your heart alive, letting it be seen, experienced, and felt. So if we look at that definition that's at the top of there, what ecstatic authenticity means is that you are in such deep relationship with you. You are so in love with you. You so know, honor, and respect you that you never want to be anything but you. Like you're cool and not in an arrogant, all about me kind of way, but just this like, yeah, I'm cool. I'm not going to I'm not going to settle, sell myself out or twist myself into a pretzel anymore for anybody or anything. And oh, by the way, settling, selling yourself out, it's about thinking that if you're feminine, you're not supposed to be. It's about thinking that, oh my God, I don't want to be one of those jerk guys, so I don't let myself express my sexual energy or I don't let myself be as assertive. Or I imagine that receiving help as the feminine means I'm weak. This was my story. It was weak and pathetic. Like those are settling and selling myself out. I pretended that I was stronger. I pretended I'll ask you out when I really wanted to be asked out. Like stop. Like stop being anything but you because that is what somebody will fall in love with. And your facade of trying to be what, what you think somebody else wants to be, it's never going to last. And it takes so much energy and it's why so many of us are exhausted and frustrated and some of us, some of us go, screw it, it's too hard. It's not too hard. Soul love is amazing. It's not always easy, but it's definitely not too hard and it's incredibly rewarding. So the nice guy that I'm all about making you happy or the nice girl, whatever, the pleaser, like that's another way that we sell ourselves out. And so this first phase is about you. It's about self-love. It's about who you're being and it's an expression of your soul. We've got to wake up your soul. And it is the place where we come into knowing that we are enough. That we come into knowing that we are whole and complete on our own. We don't need someone to fulfill us. And it's also that place where we go, I'm okay even though... I suck at that, or I'm okay even though I get upset, or I'm okay even though I'm not always the nicest person, and or that I make mistakes. Or, you know, one of mine is I was, you know, out the other night with a, a new date and I said, turn right, or I said, turn left, and I pointed to the right. Like, that's one of the things that I do. I mess up my right and my left. And I could be really embarrassed about that. And at times I still am, but then that's, you know, like that's just part of me. And so whatever it is, like we try to hide our failures or our weaknesses or what we haven't accomplished, but knowing that we're worth loving, this is part of ecstatic authenticity. Like I'm not going to make myself bad. I'm not going to play small because I'm not perfect or because I don't have it all together. That's another story that I hear from women all the time is I got to have my life together before a man's going to want me. No, it doesn't work that way. Actually, the masculine, again, talking about heterosexual relationships, the masculine actually wants to contribute. And it's one of the reasons that strong, independent women have such a hard time keeping a relationship is because they tell men they don't need any. They tell men they don't need anything. And the man goes, okay, uh, no place for me here. And this is, I'm not talking codependence. So this is one of those where I could dive in and we spend, I spend a whole weekend talking about actually multiple weekends talking about conscious relating and these dynamics between men and women. And so just to know I'm scratching the surface with that. But the point being is that this is where you build a relationship with you. Into me, I see. I look at me, I know me, and then I'm willing to share me with you warts and all. One of the things that I'll also show you that we look at in the deeper programs is the diamond of sacred you. And it's, it's the path to self-love. And oh, by the way, we're not going to get into this, but on this lower half of the diamond where we're still getting to know each other or know ourselves, I should say, we're actually not available for love. Like we have to move up this diamond of sacred you, this diamond of self-love, at least to the midpoint before we're even available to love and be loved. 
Now we can deepen in love, but in this half, and so I can't tell you the number of people that I work with that are like, oh yeah, I love myself. And then they look at this and they go, oh my God, I have no relationship with myself. So if you're one of those people, for example, that if somebody says, what makes you happy? What are your needs? What are your wants? What are your desires? What are your dreams? If you can't answer those questions, then you are not up on this diamond. So knowing you, having that deep relationship with you is critical. So that's ecstatic authenticity. That's the first phase of the journey, activating your soul's love. Then when you're available, when you're willing to be seen in all of your greatness, in all of your mess, then you can experience what I call loving soul to soul, which creates the experience of ecstatic intimacy, the second column that you see. And this is where the bond of the heart, of the, the beings comes into this place of intimacy where the depth of connection goes deeper and deeper and deeper, where we learn to relate and see into each other. In, I let you, if we were in relationship, I let you see into me. This is vulnerable and it's intimate. Into me, you see. But if I put up that wall and I don't let you see into me, we can't have a relationship and we sure as heck aren't relating soul to soul. So into me, you see. And we create an experience where love is ignited. Like we bring love to the relationship. This isn't where love is born. We bring love to the relationship. And now through our connection, it is ignited and amplified in depth and expression. And so this heart connection is the loving soul to soul, the second phase. And the whole reason we do phase one and we do phase two is why we need the ecstatic authenticity is that if we're not being authentic, there's no way we can be intimate. And if we want more intimacy, then we have to have more authenticity. And so we do these two phases so we can have the third phase, which is the ecstasy, which by living and loving in this ecstatic union, we have an experience of ecstatic ecstasy. It is where bliss is born. It's where freedom exists. It's where joy truly exists. If we're not being authentic and we're not sharing in connection, joy doesn't have any possibility. So we've got to honor ourselves and find our unhappiness before we can really experience joy and be ourselves, the freedom, the, the passion, this is where passion comes alive. This is where we can unite body to body. It's where in our, it's, this happens in bed and out. Like we feel the union, whether we're in a hug in the kitchen or we're making love and we don't know where one body ends and the other begins because we're in such deep union with each other. And so the loving and ecstatic Living in loving and ecstatic union, creating the ecstatic ecstasy is truly about union. Into me, you are. There's no separation between us anymore. Into me, you are. We are in union. We are in the depths of heart to heart, body to body, soul to soul connection. We circulate the pleasure sexually and we experience it in life, whether we're across the planet or next to each other in bed. We're in that kind of union with our beloved, but the truth is this is where unconditional love really lives and we become in union with life. And I'll tell you that if we look at the, the angst that is in our world and the fighting that is in our world, this third phase where we are recognizing our divine humanness and we are living in the honor, the respect, the reverence. Like what if you had a relationship that was not just connected and intimate, but what if it was reverent and sacred that this one that you were in love with was a precious treasure and it was held that way? See, part of the reason our relationships fail is because we don't hold them as sacred. We don't hold each other as sacred. We take for granted. What if we were made love to from a place of reverence? 
the whole me too thing, which I would love to do. I would love to do an entire weekend on and actually have a conscious sexuality retreat coming up next weekend that we'll talk about me too and that movement. And what does it mean? But part of the problem there is that we're not holding body, heart, soul, spirit. We're not holding ourselves and each other as sacred. And I actually say ourselves, part of that whole challenge is that we don't hold ourselves sacred. And I am as guilty as, as the next places where I have not held that priceless treasure of myself. And we've all been guilty of it on some level. And so this is the kind of relationship that has the reverence, the, the honor, the sacredness of each other and meeting in that day after day. And it doesn't mean we can't have raw animal sex because that's what some people will hear when I get, when I say sacred, oh, I can't have any fun and I can't have that raw, you know, passionate sex. Not true. It actually makes it more possible. It was one of the retreats a couple of months ago where we really looked at like where the rawest primal sex becomes so available is when there is the deep reverence and trust because we can let go and we know that we can go anywhere with this partner and we're going to be connected and we're going to be safe and loved. This is the kind of ecstasy that we're talking about. And so the question for you is if we talk about this path of soul love that starts with ecstatic authenticity, continues with ecstatic intimacy, and those two create the ecstatic ecstasy, and that if we want more ecstasy, we have to have more intimacy. And if we want more intimacy, we have to have more authenticity. So the question for you is, how far during your lifetime do you want to journey down that path of soul love? And if you want that ecstasy, which I'm guessing if you're here listening to this on some level you do, but you may not. But if you want that, then I invite you to start paying attention to the authenticity and the intimacy. And I'm gonna conclude in a couple of minutes by sharing the five biggest mistakes that are made in dating and relating, the three reasons that first dates fail, and the five bonding factors. And what I wanna share with you before that is that if you want more, ecstaticintimacy.com is my website. And I want to share with you one of my current clients. He's been actually in one of my programs just over a month, maybe six weeks. And he sent me an email today because he saw the, the post about tonight's webinar. And he said, the truth for me since day one in working with you, love has built in my daily life with me, with my kids, all of my family all of my friends. And I had never, he goes on to say that he recognizes I have so much love in my life today that I never knew. Said, am I having sex yet? No, but I used to have sex. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I used to have sex to avoid what I was feeling almost as a drug. And uh, that now I want sex, this is quote, I want sex to be a sacred part of my relationship with her. And so what's possible very, very quickly, he feels more empowered, he feels more confident, and he, oh, there was another sentence in there that I didn't share that was so cool. He said, I have a number of women that I would love to spend holiday time with, and I sense now that they would love to spend it with me as well. And this is a man who has never, in 56 years, I believe, dated for love. And now he's like, oh, I could ask all these women out. And there's this connection. So that's just what one man has shared in about six weeks worth of, of work. And so with that, I have a deep prayer 
that every man and woman, but particularly you, because you're sitting here on this call, that you experience the kind of soul to soul love that we're talking about here, that you experience the ecstasy of living and loving in the soul love, in the union of divine and human, in being the incredible being that you are and being loved for it. So with that, that's my prayer. And now I want to share with you first the, the five mistakes that are the biggest killers of dating and relating. And we've talked about some of these tonight, but the first one, so we're going to do this like um, David Letterman used to do them. So number five on the list, trying to be what you think they'll like. I don't care if you're on a date or you're in a relationship, trying to be what you think they like is going to destroy the relationship. So that's number five. Number four waiting until you're in relationship or waiting until you have a problem in your relationship to learn how to relate. Like singles think, oh, I'll figure out my sex life when I get in a relationship. Oh, we'll do that communication class when I get in a relationship. That's too late. The time to figure it out. Or we're great right now. I have a couple that's, they're, they're probably about to get engaged and they're back because they want to know how to set their relationship up for success in the long term. Don't wait until it's a problem. Don't wait until you meet your soulmate and you're working out your issues. Like work them out ahead of time. So that's number four. Number three, not knowing your own needs, wants, desires, boundaries, turn ons, turn offs. Like not knowing that is going to be an absolute killer. It leads back to the self-abandonment, which that therapist confirmed after her 40 years is the number one destroyer. You've got to know you. That's that diamond of self-love that I showed you. Number two, making the other person's needs more important than your own. The airplane, put your face mask on first, is still the truth here. And if you continually, it's not to say that their needs won't ever be first. They will be. But if they're always first, it breeds resentment. And resentment is a killer of love. So number two could be put as resentment. And that is putting somebody else's needs ahead of your own all the time or consistently. You got to put you first. And the number one mistake in dating and relating is expecting love to be perfect. We're human. This is human love. We are not living divine, unconditional love. We get to experience more and more of that. When we walk that path of soul love, we absolutely get to experience more and more of it. But as long as we're in a human body, we're not an ascended master, if you will, that we are going to be human and we are going to be fallible and so is our partner. And learning how to forgive and communicate and not take it personal are critical essences of having that great relationship. So those are the five biggest mistakes. Then the three biggest reasons that first dates fail. One, well, actually three. So David Letterman style again. The third biggest reason is we're not honest about our long-term desire and vision. Like we walk in and we think, I want to get married, but if they know I want to get married, then they're not going to be interested in me. Well, if they're not interested in you because you want to get married, they're not your one. Stop dating them. Don't even go on day two. If you want kids and they don't want kids, they're not your one. Tell, figure it out up front. Like we set ourselves up for way too much heartache. So be honest. And maybe you don't talk about it on the first date, but if you do, if it comes up, what do you really want in relationship? What are you looking for? Be honest. Way too many of us hide what we truly need, want, and desire in relationship. And it's going to affect the quality of the date. Second one, we're being on our best behavior. And, yet, and then we're not being real. Because when we're trying to be in our best behavior, we, do, we get stiff. We don't relax. Like people, have you ever noticed that the ones that you're not interested in are the most interested in you? Well, it's because you're relaxed. You're not trying to get them. So you just be you 
And in the meantime, they fall in love with you because you're being you. Maybe not fall in love with you on the first date, but they're really attracted to you because you're being you. So when you try to be something, oh, all this stuff gets in the way and the really good ones get away because they can't feel us because we're not being us. So be you. And the uh, number one, similar to the mistakes, is we go, ah, he's not a fit. She's not a fit because she does that or he does that. And we filter them out before we really get to know them. Now, I won't say that there are, are some things that just right off the bat, this is not going to work. True. But what I see way too often is that we make a lot of judgments way too fast because we're trying to protect ourselves. And there's so much opportunity to experience and connect and have a lot of fun and find out, could this be a match? So don't end it too soon. And now let's end with the five bonds of love. And number five, number five is that shared vision. And when I work with clients through my series of programs, we will find each individual soul's vision for love. And then we look at how to create the sole purpose vision of a relationship, the two people and their purposes join together. And so what binds our relationships? See, our relationships used to get bound by survival in the past. We don't need relationships to survive anymore. We don't have to have a relationship. And yet, what now in our evolved and evolving relationships, what holds us together is this shared purpose, this shared vision. So that's number five. Number four is heartfelt agreements. It's something that I teach called the, a conscious beginnings ritual. And in your conscious beginnings ritual, you set some agreements and some intentions that you agree to, to build this conscious soul to soul relationship. Here's the container within which we want to hold our relationship as sacred, as honored, as treasured, and hold each other that way. And it may be agreements about honesty and sex and conflict. And there's a variety of things that we look at when we set up a conscious beginnings ritual for a soul to soul relationship. But having that kind of foundation so that your relationship can go to the edges of ecstasy and beyond, you can go to the depths of conflict and come back into union because you've got this container of your conscious relationship. And so that's the conscious beginnings ritual that creates this container for ecstatic love to live in. Three, we've been talking about this one and I know it's the one where the body wants to tighten up, but it's vulnerability. The third bonding factor is vulnerability. And it is made up of the authenticity and the intimacy that are those first two phases in that path of soul love. But if we want a truly bonded relationship, it's not about showing how strong and great we are all the time. It's about being vulnerable in our humanness. So that's three. Four, a commitment to your soul your soul's evolution, your authenticity, your ecstatic authenticity. When I share in my Activating Soul Love program, the eight secrets to lasting and passionate relationship, the number one secret is put you first. Because when you don't, go back to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, resentment. And resentment is a killer of love. So you have to be committed to your soul's expression, embodiment, and enlivenment, your soul's ecstasy for that matter, in order for the two of you and your partner is going to do the same. And in that, you can actually connect in the depths. So number two, you have to honor and commit to your soul and its expression. And then one, takes us all the way back to the very first thing that I talked about, and that's our misunderstanding of love. It's recognizing that the relationship 
isn't generating the love. Your partner is not bringing you the love. That you're not devoid of love until you have a relationship or until you have a partner that makes sure you feel loved. That you live in love. That you are the love that you are and you bring it to the relationship and then it gets better and then it gets enhanced. But the number one bonding factor is the love that is the container of the relationship, not that you're dependent on the relationship to get love. That love is the essence of the relationship itself. And that's what soul love is. And that kind of soul love creates the opportunity for soul sex and ecstatic ecstasy. And that soul love of you, loving soul to soul with another and uniting body, heart, soul, and spirit. This is soul love. This is soul sex. This is the path of ecstatic intimacy. This is a life lived in ecstasy, joy, freedom, truth, love, passion. This is my prayer for you. If this is your calling in your heart, then I pray that we get to have a personal one-on-one conversation. It is an honor always to hold that space because I know what it was like. I know what it was like to cry those tears night after night, to be pissed, to be angry, to blame, to be hurt. And so when I can hold that space for an individual to set your love life on fire, for your love of you, for the intimacy, for the sex. Because we got to, you know, we're not going to have a great lasting relationship without a sex life. Like that's inherently part of it. And so for some of us, that's challenging, men and women alike. And so to create a space where you get to explore all of you and your living and loving in love. Ecstaticintimacy.com. And here's to your soul to soul ecstatically lived life, even if it's never felt that way before, even if you're starting to lose hope, I guarantee you there's hope, there's attractiveness, there's passion, there's heart, there's tenderness, there is love, massive love available for you. It's my hope that I get to serve you more and I send you huge blessings in love. Namaste, which means the divine in me acknowledges and sees the divine in you. I know that you're here and bringing your divine essence. So blessings to you.